Okay, welcome. Good morning, afternoon. Wonderful to see everybody. Um, and wow, I think there's over 200 people registered for today. So what a wonderful turnout. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we're on today. While we meet on this virtual platform, it's also important to acknowledge that we're all living on ancestral lands and unceded territories of Indigenous people across the country and around the world. We make this acknowledgement to show our gratitude and to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improve relationships between our nations and our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their culture. My name is Polly Gardner and I'm a faculty fellow with CQ and also the coordinator of this public seminar series. Thank you for joining us here today. The plan is some brief introductions, then we'll start the presentation, which will be approximately 50 minutes. Uh, then we'll open it up to some question and answer and a discussion. Just a reminder that the session is being recorded. So Tenzin's got the recording on. And uh, during the presentation, if you could please make sure that your um, microphones are muted and also the interpreters have asked that we turn our cameras off. So if you would do that, please. Um, we will not be monitoring the chat during the presentation today, but we will use that and the hand raising tool afterwards for the uh, discussion and question and answer period. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. I first met Josephine in Peggy McDonough's uh, graduate social theory and health course at the University of Toronto. Josephine and I were just having a little tussle conversation about when that was, but uh, I think it was about 20 years ago. So, uh, so we're in this course and I am not a sociologist. And I remember the first three, three weeks of that course having absolutely no idea what anyone was saying. <laughs> One of the assignments we had in the course was that I was teamed up with Josephine and we were tasked with leading a seminar on Borgit. So I know Josephine was trained as a nurse and similarly had very little background in social theory. So immediately I thought, we're screwed. My plan going in was to tell a lot of jokes and hopefully nobody would notice that we knew nothing about Bordeaux. But Josephine, of course, as all of us who have worked with her know, is not someone to shy away from difficulty or challenges. Come on, she said, we can do this. With that little mischievous smile of hers, her determination and spirit was and is contagious and an inspiration to so many of us. This talk today, still arriving, decentering the post in post qualitative inquiry was postponed several times as Josephine reflected on what it means to present at an institution under censure. Her decision to wait to not present is but one example of who Josephine is as a scholar and a person, someone who not only pays attention to issues of inequality and social justice, but acts on them. This is reflected in her scholarship as she commits herself to working with not for communities on projects related to migration, HIV, sexual health, and mental health in diasporic and transnational communities. I could talk for days about Josephine and the impact she and her work has had on so many of us, but you have waited long enough. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Josephine Wong. Thank you very much, Polly, for that very heartwarming introduction. Uh, I'm going to put up my slides and we'll have a dialogue this afternoon. Thank you, Polly, for that really heartwarming introduction. It brought back a lot of memories. 
Uh, we were debating whether it was really 20 years ago, and I can prove based on evidence that it wasn't 20 years ago, it was 19 point something years ago because we started school in September. So I would also like to take this time to acknowledge my commitment for reconciliation in Canada. And I had watched a video that was really well done by uh, two indigenous women that talk about Toronto. Uh, the name of Toronto is actually Takaronto, meaning the place in the water where trees are standing, which is said to refer to the wood wooden stakes that were used as fishing weirs in the narrows of local river systems by the Haudenosaunee and Huron-Wendat peoples. And what was really touching me when I was learning from this video about doing land acknowledgements were that they talked about how covered under the concrete of Toronto, there are many, many stories and histories. And that reminded me of the kind of things that we are interested in, that's why we're all gathering together here, that stories, histories, uh, things matters, whether we can see them or not, whether some of these stories are intentionally erased from us, or some of them are hidden, or some of them have transformed. All those have something to do with our lived experience and how we relate to each other, and also in the topic of research. So then when I got up this morning, Gigi patted me on the shoulder and Gigi said, are you ready for your presentation today? And I said, I'm not sure. And Gigi said, what does that mean? And I said, well, I'm still arriving. So this is Gigi. And some of you might have seen it because you know the, the screen sharing didn't work. And so to me, um, I am joining today uh, in, in some moment, I feel really excited to have this chance to really talk about uh, something that I am still very undecided about, and also to help have the opportunity to meet many of you that we were studying together. I kind of saw you on the screen, and surely to declare that I'm not any expert, and as Polly said, I have been trained in nursing and public health nursing. I'm not a sociologist. However, I do think that I have some embodied knowledge that I could share with you and learn from you. So today our topic is still arriving. So decentering the post in post qualitative inquiry. So you can see from this picture that when I first read an article by uh, Saint Pierre on post qualitative inquiry, I was very curious. And you can see all this reaction on the screen. And it is really worth noting that you see all this uh, emoji avatar, some of them had no words. And yet I had a feeling that some of you actually could resonate with how I was feeling. And so then again, that has something to do with what we can talk about. Uh, there's a lot of interest in new materialism. There's a lot of uh, things about how do we interact? How do we create our identities in what space? And as we were conversing before this seminar started, that we now are engaging in different ways of thinking about the world, about social reproduction of space, including virtual space, lived space, and post-humanism, how are we connected to everything, everywhere? So then after my initial, all those emotions that you saw, I decided that, you know, if I am curious and I am passionate about learning as I sometimes claim that I am, so I better get grounded, be open-minded, and also start looking at the literature and thinking about all these topics with no judgment, to be critical, but not really in a judgmental way. And along the way, I found a chameleon to hang out with. And I'll explain a little bit more about how this chameleon came to, into my uh, reality. So something that I think we can talk about is what is inquiry and what is research? And how are they different or are they the same? 
what is the purpose for pursuing inquiry or research? And how does one engage in inquiry versus research? Who benefits from the outcome? And who has access to engage in either of them? And so those are the kind of um, nudging that I would like you to keep in mind as you know, I talk more about what I have learned. So the key impression from reading lots and lots and lots of articles, and I was telling Polly that this is like going back to school and Polly said, this is good for you. And I would say, yes, I agree, it's good for me. The impression that I had is that the post-qualitative inquiry movement draws heavily on post-structural theory, especially those of Le uh, Deleuze and Gautari. And I'm not familiar with uh, Deleuze and Gautari's work, but I had a general idea about uh, the kind of concept. And it is very exciting. Uh, some of the ideas that were highlighted by many authors writing about qualitative inquiry will be concepts like rhizomes within and against interpretivism, becoming lines of flight, uh, transgressions, loose and straighted place, space, deterritorialization, and then re-territorialization, disruption assemblages of desire and all that. And what I wanted to point out is that before I engage with this material, many of these concepts, although they might not be named as rhizomes, they might not be named as lines of light, actually do exist in philosophy around the world. And because I grew up uh, in Hong Kong until I became a young teenager before my family migrated to Canada, some of these uh, ideas that I have already embodied. And so when I read something like that, I say, oh, that just sounds like this. So then uh, there was a, an issue in qual qualitative inquiry that the entire issue was actually dedicated to the discussion of the post-qualitative movement. And the authors who actually wrote the, the, the first article for introduction talk about that this is a movement that can be characterized as new materialisms. So emphasizing the entangled, agential and vibrant aspect of the material world. It is also about new empiricism that is really tied to paying attention to the ontoepistemological formation that make empiricism possible. In other words, um, many of them are saying that is in diving yourself into concept theories, especially post-structural theories that when you are reading, learning, dialoguing with the material, then ideas will come out. And then you have a new way of doing inquiry. And the experimentalism will be something that comes out. And later on, I'm going to, to show some of the, the statements and, and narratives that for the ones that is being talked about here, I'm totally embracing. I think that's wonderful. Um, I love innovation, I love creativity, and I think that the academia got to give us more space and more time to actually do that, to think outside of the box, to reimagine what the world could be like, but it's not good enough to reimagine, we got to do something about it and to experiment. So those are all good for me. And then I was reading um, in the same issue, St. Pierre actually talked about refusing methodology and is really uh, saying that post-structural theories and concepts wouldn't allow us to think about methodology. And so qualitative, post-qualitative movement is not qualitative methodology with a twist. And I feel I could respect that. Anybody who would come out with any kind of theory and concept, they could debate and argue and set their boundaries, uh, but whether we resonate with it and go with it, that's a whole different matter. And she likes to advise her student to read hard, write hard and think hard. And I totally buy into that. So if anyone of you in this room is my student, please take that to heart. 
because I'm finding that nowadays uh, getting students to read hard, write hard, and think hard seems to be very hard. And right now, I will give the excuse to the pandemic. But when the pandemic is over, we'll have a different kind of conversation. Uh, but what really um, kind of baffled me a little bit is when she went on and say that through the reading, writing, and thinking, it will give us the expertise and confidence, and then it will likely point us to do something. And this is the part that I cannot agree with uh, because I had different kind of philosophical assumption tied to inquiry and research, and research. And I was finding the tone of the paper begin to become a little bit constraining and restrictive. So it is not about students using um, dropping down to a pre-existing research methodology. And so when I was trying to imagine what that means, uh, suddenly I see a lot of power issue that is going on. And maybe that's just my personal uh, perception. And so students cannot claim that they do post qualitative inquiry unless they truly are doing that. And the kind of thing that I worry about is, and I really appreciate Polly's introduction. Uh, and you know, we didn't really um, kind of plan that. We were just kind of reminiscing of the past. And for students to go and really dive into post-structural theory and read hard, write hard in order to come up with a project, then it could be very um difficult and challenging for some students, especially nowadays when we know that we all live in a neoliberal world and our academic university are saying that our students need to graduate in four years. And also for some students, depending on what's the purpose of the kind of research they want to do, it might not actually not be appropriate. But what I appreciate what St. Pierre said is that just don't choose to do it and don't claim to do it. And that I could really appreciate. So then the other part, um, I read an other uh, article, which is a more relaxing informal one. This is actually an interview of St. Pierre uh, with uh, three other early career researchers. And once again, I was a little bit taken back by the language that was used, uh, the way she talked about collaboration. She think that collaboration had been highly romanticized. If we think we do not have a separate existence, and if we think we are not individual separating from other people and everything else, then the word collaboration doesn't make sense. And I'm taken back by that uh, because there are all kinds of other philosophy, for instance, Buddhist philosophy, Eastern philosophy, that already established, you know, more than you know, 2,500 years ago that we don't have a separate existence. And yes, collaboration is actually a key part, a part of that philosophy. So this is a part that kind of made me feel I don't get it. And the other part is that St. Pierre also come to recognize in reality that when students go and follow the post qualitative methodology, that there are times that you need to actually go and sell what you're doing to others because after all students need to go and get fellowship. After they graduate, they do have to pay rent. They do have to live. And so she talks about how uh, within the, the recent years, there are now many, many, uh, I would call them academic capital that students can now cite to legitimate this new work. And as I was reading, so I am also seeing in my mind that this movement is totally also complicated, implicated within the, the existing world that we are living in. And this is where the, the chameleon kind of jumped on my shoulder. And I could not stop thinking about Verdu, about the, the way we play in the academic field, the meta field of knowledge production. And then within those fields, you have the qualitative, you have the quantitative, and then how within some of the subfield that we are also 
constantly competing to create symbolic capital. And, and that's something that, uh, that really struck me. And I love the, the metaphor of chameleon because in life and research and knowledge production, they are always things that can change in a way that go with um, the dynamics in the world. And that is what's so lovely about the chameleon because they have beautiful colors that can change with what is happening in the context. And I came across um, some articles that actually express their disagreement with qualitative inquiry movement. And I really appreciate some of these articles because they really resonated with me. So Wolgamuth and uh, a few other colleagues got together and they talked about uh, their reaction. And so the authors of this paper actually consists of tenured professor, uh, pre-tenured professors, postdoc, and they, they really talk about post-qualitative inquiry have become for them, this is how they interpret it, it become an island of misfit toys. This parade theories that offer only peripheral interconnectedness. And I'm not, I do not know post-qualitative inquiry movement well enough to really agree or disagree. Um, but this is how they resonate with it. And I think that part is really important. Every time we put out a piece of work, um, it's important. And, and something that I wanted to add was when I was reading the paper by St. Pierre about why she went about um, to start this movement with uh, some other scholar, she was talking about what kind of challenges she felt she experienced because she was learning methodology without having to learn theory. And the, everything about what she had to do seemed to be such positivist uh, way of doing things. And the kind of rules that Cresswell Im imposed on others. And I have this argument with colleagues too. I do not like his books. Um, but the thing was, her experience might not be the same for everybody. I came into the program, the Dalai Lama's <laughs> social science and health program as a nurse, as a, a community nurse. Uh, my master's degree was in nursing, uh, but I was very fortunate. And I should say that we should not rely our life on fortune. Um, it's really, when I say I was fortunate, it means that within the structure of the system that is not equitable and inaccessible, there was a glimpse and an open door. And I happened to have met uh, Denise Castaldo and I did a great job with my master thesis. And I, will, I'm, I want to bring this out because St. Pierre's experience might not be for everybody. And therefore to, for her to start a movement that is against qualitative inquiry, or to be saying that we are already after qualitative inquiry. To me, that was a little bit unsettling uh, because I learned so much theory, <laughs> so many, 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 many classes of theories. And I dived into theories. And at a time that we don't have electronic access like many of you do today, and I could not understand what she was talking about because I learned throughout my graduate studies, including in the master program, because I was learning from Professor Pat McKeever uh, from Denise Gastaldo. And in my PhD, I was learning from Blake Poland, from Joan, from Peggy. And theory is everywhere. And we kind of walk and talk and sleep and dream about theory. And so for me, I agree with what she was saying, that we must pay attention to ontolo ontological and epistemological assumptions, but at the same time to kind of throw out the entire qualitative research, I was a little bit hesitant. And Wugemuth and her colleagues were talking about their feeling that this movement is creating something that maybe we are not reflexive about. What kind of mutualism and become parasitic so that 
in creating academic um, capital, we might be advancing ourselves in Korea in our research, but what does it do for others, on others, and from others? And they are also concerned about this catchphrase or identity card. Are you truly a post-qualitative inquiry person? And they're concerned about how this is really separating people in a way that eventually it actually will become positivism. The other part that they really point out and resonated with me, and that's why I asked those questions at the beginning is, for what purpose are we doing inquiry? And if we are spending so much energy into defining, again, categorizing people into which camp they are in, we might be actually losing our energy to be doing work together that is working towards some urgent agenda that we need to deal with. And that is the kind of increasingly uh, injustices that is experienced locally and globally. But Tacharya had something that is a little bit different and her paper was quite reflective. And I really appreciate what she said about if knowledge is never innocent, but in inescapably express the interest of its producer. I begin to wonder whose interest I preserve, replicate and proliferate by aligning my work with certain scholars. And so she had done a lot of colonial, post-colonial um, studying and she is concerned about if we engage in epistemic violence, then what will be the consequences? And this is something that, you know, I'll talk a bit more. There are more attention now to the whole idea about epistemic justice, violence, knowledge, uh, justice, that kind of stuff. But what really struck me was her anecdotal narrative about this one time in class when a black woman said to her, we are 60% black in Memphis and the white men still sign our paycheck. What will your Deleuze, Gotari and Foucault do for me? And I constantly think about this and I constantly, I would love to engage in theories and stuff. And, but at the same time, I often ask myself, there are only so much resources not only for me personally, but in the world. So when I engage in research and inquiry, what are the purposes? And if we are all really interconnected, then it is my accountability to know that it's not really just purely for my enjoyment. And of course, you know, about reading in late into the night and having panda looking eyes, whether that's enjoyment is another story. And so, her critical reflexive thinking was that in her role as you know, a professor, as a teacher, as a writer, as an author, because it's not only in front of the classroom that we're teaching. Every time we publish something, we are leaving something in the virtual space and the library. And those are discourses that can be used. Those are narratives that can be used to advance certain values, or it could be something that actually hold people back and continue to perpetuate uh, other kinds of, of, of values. And so she was really reflecting on how she had and whether she was really engaging in also erasing um, people's knowledge, especially the marginalized one. So the one thing when I was preparing for today's talk is I went back to when I was actually in the time hanging out with Polly. Um, I read work from Huron and Reason and it appealed to me because when I did my master in nursing, I was the last cohort to do a thesis and I was grounded in empowerment theory, the work of Paula Freire and, and, and many um, scholars who were doing community-based action research. And as I started my PhD, I started reading even more. And I always appre appreciate hearing and reasons work because in some of the qualitative training and research courses or readings, sometimes we don't talk about axiological question. 
And that is what is the fundamental values that we believe in that is about certain human condition. And even in the way of doing research, the kind of question that we ask, what will be the value behind it? And what's the value of being? And so for me, that has stayed with me and really kind of reminded me so that I don't run off and just join the neoliberal power because it seems to be much easier. And another author is Merton and Merton really pointed out that axiological assumptions are critical because it is a way for us to be more responsive to culture, to power inequities, and also making visible uh, discrimination and oppression and working towards social justice. And so revealing something, disrupting something, opening up so that we can see even underneath the concrete uh, sidewalk are things that I feel very um, inclined to do. That's the way I just feel that's how I want to be. So then my interpretation of post-qualitative inquiry is really an invitation to think through post-structural philosophy theories and to resist the tyranny of positivist convention and normative rules. And I appreciate that because uh, sometimes when I get comments back from reviewers and I just want to jump up and down, not enjoy, but I want to swear, even though I have been brought up not to swear. And reviewers from grants review from, from journals. However, at the same time, I also appreciate what Hoy had written about resistance. Resistance is never simply to constrain in general, because one is always constrained by something or another. For instance, for two days, I couldn't go anywhere because of the snow. There is no originary freedom with absolute no constraint. Resistance comes when one sense not only one's dependence on these constraints, but also one's tendency to give in to them. And so I guess my resonance with the post-qualitative inquiry movement is that I'm okay with people having movements. There, you know, there's not enough movements in the world. Let people have more movements. But at the same time, how do they go about doing a movement so that they themselves do not actually become um, representing the tyranny of positivism or further marginalized groups when we had not even arrived into an equitable you know, plane where everybody actually could dialogue and share knowledges in way that actually are being listened to and also being valued. And knowledge, we know that informed policy making resource distribution. So how do we do that when we had not even arrived there? So as I said before, Verdue's notion of field um, and capital kept on popping in my head and I, I guess not me, but my chameleon asks, is there a post-structuralism post movement that is coming soon? And so for me, doing critical qualitative inquiry is about how do we actually really align all these really key concepts that I have learned in my graduate school. And I often told you know, people who are not in the academia, and they say, you spend so many years in studying to, to get your PhD. You never seem to have time to go to a movie. Now you're teaching and you're just the same. Do you ever regret it? And I said, never, because I have to say that my graduate studies really had opened me up as a person. It's not really about getting a job and all that stuff but it allows me to actually look at life and look at the world differently and understanding my experience in the context in relations to everybody else. And I feel it has supported me partly, not just a graduate uh, education, but my graduate education is actually part of the element where if I move to another realm and I died and I'm no longer on this plane, this earth, I have no regret, and I think that is actually pretty um, 
I feel I'm pretty blessed because of that. So I just want to talk a little bit about my journey. As I said, I was born and raised in Hong Kong, which was a British colony. And I left as a young teenager. And that was before Hong Kong became the kind of center of prosperity. And our education was bilingual. The history I learned was very British, you know, lens. Um, we were taught and we used to feel ashamed of the opium war, not because the British came and started a war and tried to colonize China, but because we were taught to feel ashamed of our people getting addicted to opium and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, because it's a bilingual education, I learned a lot from poetry. The way we learn um, may not be appreciated by the post qualitative movement people because we had to learn poetry. And the way we learn is you memorize every single thing and you have to stand in class and you recite everything without looking at the book. And at first, a lot of people critique and think that that way of learning, you know, in some of the Asian cultures is really like, how does that make people have critical thinking? But what I realized when I reflected on the, the, the poems that my mom rhymed with us when we were small, and I learned at school, it's already about post-humanism. Because in the poem where there's four phrases you already included the land, the sun, and everything. So therefore, is after I've done my graduate studies that I begin to actually appreciate what I learned and appreciate the kind of knowledges that although it's being marginalized, that I'm drawing a lot of richness from it. Then I went through high school, never learned about indigenous history. I went to undergraduate program. Uh, learned a little bit about um, indigenous history, but more from the settler's point of view. And I went into university. And as I said, um, after I graduated from um, all my studies and being able to think, being able to challenge, being able to overthrow some of the stuff that had been imposed on me, I am at a point where you can see me in the right corner here that I'm feeling that um, I'm very grateful for the kind of colors in my thinking that are not just within a box. And it is a journey because you see my path is still going. I just don't know where it's going yet. And for me, then what is really important is I need to reflect on my role and my position. I am a professor, I am a researcher, and I want to bridge embodied knowledge. And sometimes I start with myself. I am still indulging in curiosity and desire to learn. Otherwise I would have picked you know, a non-controversial topic and just come and do my part here just so that because I want to see you all and talk to you. I want to really be part of going beyond Eurocentric and other dominant ideas. And it's not good enough for us to complain. It's not good enough for us to critique. But how do I take part in it myself? I need to keep on talking about that. And I want to think with axial onto epistemological assumptions. And do you know how hard it is for me as a second language person to say all these terms? It'll be a lot easier if it's in Cantonese connecting with values of social justice and equity. And that is something that um, I would say is an embodied experience because I watched what my maternal grandmother did and I watched how she interacted with all the other women. If she is alive, she will be maybe a hundred and, I don't know, more than 120 years old. So she was illiterate because she wasn't allowed to go to school. And being accountable in my role as a researcher and, and teacher. So now I want to really talk a little bit about teaching because I can't really talk about teaching, talking about inquiry and, and research without talking about teaching, because after all, it is through some of these processes all over the place that we are entangled in them. 
And so in my teaching, I am pushing myself to really integrate authors and, and different knowledges from uh, different scholars. And what I really appreciate, and this is part of the reading that my student had to do in graduate school, when we are talking about theories, theories are not there for me. My value is that theories are not just there so that we have a nice conversation, challenge each other's mind. Theory actually act. Theory can actually do something. And so however we use theory and whatever theory we put out, we could be acting either intentionally or unintentionally that could be promoting um, well-being for all people or marginalizing people. And so um, Marshall talked about, Albert Marshall, Marshall talked about our responsibility is really theory is about life, what we do, what kind of responsibility and how we live on this earth. And to me, that's very much tied to just like the way we talk about axiological assumption. And the reason why, you know, knowledge justice is so important is because if we force people to abandon their ways of knowing, their ways of seeing the world, then we literally destroy their spirit. And once that spirit is destroyed, it's very, very, very difficult to embrace anything. And to me, when I use this type of um, readings for my student is critical because I am in a school of nursing and our students' interaction with the world have impact. So this is, no, we are not, I'm not in the faculty of philosophy. So then there's also, as I pointed out before, that Eastern philosophy could be contributing to holistic education as there are more and more discourses about post-humanism, uh, about the oneness, about how we are all interconnected. These are philosophy that had existed for thousands of years and people have practiced. And we can learn to think through some of this uh, naming. So for instance, since pure awareness had no object to be witnessed, it becomes non-dual awareness and turn out to be one with everything. And so in a lot of the post-structural uh, debates and argument, it is really about challenging and dismantling the kind of thinking about dualism and dichotomous uh, naming and the way we divide the people into all these boxes so that they could be kept in ways that are actually inferior or subordinated. And so this article also talk about that you know, the soul of witness itself dissolves and there's only the play of non-dual awareness, awareness that does not look at objects, but is completely one with all objects. Now, some of you might think that, okay, what's your nursing students won't get out of it? Well, one of the, the program that I have been doing with my colleagues in the community to address internalize and, and act a stigma in HIV and in mental illness is actually tied to this. This concept actually had been integrated into third wave uh, psychology in North America and around the world, even though um, they never had to kind of uh, reference it. And I all often wonder how did they get away with it when our students actually get charged with plagiarism. But those things are there and this type of philosophy actually really helped to liberate ourselves and diffuse from ideas about ourselves that actually pull us back and keep us in ways that actually contribute to us feeling anxious, uh, depressed, and sometimes frozen so that we cannot move forward in life. So another beautiful article that I really resonated with and I just love um, is really about four arrows talk about his experience when he was traveling somewhere and then the currents came and he was stuck. And at that moment, it is really about letting go. And as he let go, he had this sense of peace, of oneness with the world. 
and felt a knowing that defies knowledge. Every rock, every water, source and tree, every creature seemed to be an intimate relation or a teacher emerging at just the right time. You see, post-humanism had always been in some people's way of being and life. And therefore, when we are doing a lot of what we think to be uh, innovative, cutting edge discourses and narratives, sometimes it helps for us to have the humility to actually step back and actually further look into what has been hidden, the treasure that actually we not, we have not even discovered. And that reminds me of um, doing a reading course with Joan on critical realism. And what I also really appreciate and I put a smile on my face was when four arrows talk about when I came back, a miraculous new rapport seemed to exist between the horse and me. So this is um, another article that I put into the reading list. And we know that there's lots of discussion, lots of articles written about arts-based um, research and straight and um, the team actually had done an amazing, amazing art-based project, but in ways that is a little bit different from what I have heard. And so they have many, many communities. So on the right-hand side, you see that they actually have seven communities involved and the communities they were actually trying to do promotion, trying to do uh, prevention on, on different kinds of health practices. And what they did is instead of using the conventional positivist way of evaluating the program, they invited artists to actually go out and do the evaluation. And when they go out and do the evaluation, the artists actually immerse in their community. They listen to the story of what you know, the community members are talking about, and it included everybody. So participants, staff, and all that stuff. And then they transform what they learn into art pieces. And then those art pieces are actually installed in the communities so that it's not just a piece of work to be put in the museum. It become actually something that is alive. And so an art piece that actually becomes something that people pass by and start a conversation, someone talk about it and it become actually very engaging and the processes continue to go on. So, um, so another part is um, talking about praxis in, in Africa and what Cassie really talked about epidemic justice is really about doing inquiry and research that is in a way when we're talking about decolonizing, it is about not just the theory and concept, but it is about how do all this actually relate to people's lived realities and the institutional context in which they emerge. So it's really looking at everything that ties together and beyond theory. And in 2016, 2017, I was so excited because we were invited, um, Kenneth Fung and I were invited to actually write a chapter on acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a third wave psychotherapy that I appreciate. I like it, I integrate this, I use this. But at the same time, there was something in me that I saw in the model that I knew my grandmother was acting on, that I knew people around me when I was growing up actually already had those type of wisdom. So when we're invited to write a chapter, despite how busy we are, we wrote a chapter and it was very liberating in a sense that not only do we actually connect to the possible sources of this psychotherapy, um, but also bring out elements that's left behind because what I'm finding is that in the Western world, a lot of times wisdom from certain um, countries, other continents, other places are taken up. It becomes very popular. It becomes um, very embraced and recognized and legitimated because they're using measurement to, to prove that it is effective. 
except some of the fundamental values and underpinnings are actually taken off. And so with us, when we are using ACT, the acceptance and commitment therapy, we integrated empowerment, social justice and, and compassion into it. And I don't have time to talk about it today, but maybe someday I'll come back to CQ and we can have another conversation. And what we raise is that uh, when we're talking about Zen Buddhism, what it really emphasizes is about compassionate engagement with the world. And we have not finished doing our work unless all beings are free from suffering. And this is something that I feel we really need in the world right now. Of course, some people said that, you know, hundreds of years ago, people were saying the same thing. And another way that I really push for um, emancipatory learning is to get my student to think outside of the box. So I do assignment with them, which are integrative synthesized resonance. That means they had to think critically. They had to relate it to themselves. It's not good enough for us to think about certain ideas cognitively and just feel that it had nothing to do with me. And I feel that when we can totally engage with the material, then I would say that you know, the empathy and, and uh, compassion and those type of values would actually come out. And the way I do this is, as I said, I agree with St. Pierre, read hard, write hard. And, you know, I feel that this is important for graduate school. And so I use the table and the student actually had to make notes on every single articles that they uh, included, including the video, but they do not but I won't mark them. I would read them, I will make comment, but I won't mark them so they can use any form they want, but they will actually integrate and turn that into a resonance text that reflect what they have learned as well as discussion in class. Yeah. And so um, what, what I wanted, the reason why I wanted to share is that I had felt quite um, empowered with this way of teaching in a sense that the knowledge that we engage in class is no longer really coming from books. Uh, in the evaluation of the course, people really talk about how um, learning together and having the opportunity to resonate with each other uh, really help. And the resonance text is something that I use also in research. And um, it is something that I find that especially at the beginning, students are a little bit taken back and they don't know what to do because they only want to write cognitively. But by midterm, um, people are saying that they really appreciate this. And you can see that students are reflecting on their lived experience in relation to the kind of suffering that other people are also going through. Now, have you seen my slides change, Polly? No, we're still on the let us see slide. How about now? Uh, yes, epistemic and knowledge justice. Yep. Yes. So I'm just going to be very quickly. As I said, I only take five minutes. Um, so these are some of the samples of the kind of research I had done in the past many years, uh, this is a project that uh, when I was actually graduating from my master program. And you can see that we had been using a method that is not positivist at all. We had art space. But the one um, kind of thing I want to talk about art space is art space could become very popular and then everybody wants to do art space. I think it all depends on the mediums that the participant are actually um, comfortable with. So, and also um, in ways that even if they had never done it before, that it is something that is actually aligned with what they appreciate. But in research, as I pointed out, I feel that research processes and outcomes are very important. And in this project, we were exploring the mental health of immigrants and refugees women 
And many of the staff, the project staff that we hired were actually immigrant women, and they experienced a lot of challenges. And therefore, we deliberately uh, posted in our job posting that work experience not required because that's a barrier that a lot of racialized uh, immigrants are uh, uh, actually experiencing. We hire 1.5 second generation um, women from the different communities, as well as the first generation new immigrant so that they actually could interact with each other. And when we did our evaluation, we actually used Play-Doh in ways so that they can actually create something rather than didactically tell us what um, they, they want to say about the program. And in the left-hand corner, you see that at the beginning, everybody was hesitant to think that Asian women won't spend time coming out to the communities. And in this program, when we finished working on this program, three years later, we had 114 peer leaders from six communities that engage in it. Uh, I won't talk too much about this, but this is how we engage with people who live with HIV. And through the kind of research methods and processes using concept mapping, not in a quantitative way, but we engage people so that they come and share their lived experience. We build capacity so they understand what the policies are, how the healthcare policy affect them, what is happening in the HIV um, uh, sector. And then they together actually engage in this concept mapping where they had ideas about what are their priorities and what needs to be done. And we actually came up with seven domains from the end of this project. Um, and every single part of this domain actually had turned into uh, programs in the communities. And to me, that is very important. And many of this work are actually carried out by people living with HIV. Uh, we speak, I know that St. Pierre talk about mixed methods and some people, the moment they hear about quantitative research and mixed method, they cringe. Um, I'm a qualitative researcher, but quantitative methods can be, it is theoretical, they are useful. And so in the We Speak project, which is about um, the HIV vulnerabilities of Black men, we use mixed methods, but the kind of a survey that we did was actually including uh, surveys such as everyday experience of discrimination, access to healthcare. We do need those data to, in order to actually uh, show the world what is happening. But at the same time, we did lots of focus group and individual interviews so that the information that we get actually is also rich in defining how um, structural violence actually shape how people um, construct their identities, their masculine identities, their racialized identities, and how they interact in the world, and as well, how they resist, and what are the things that they want to do. And more recently, we do online, as many of us are cringing about online, and yet this is one of the program that is based on the acceptance and commitment uh, therapy and but we integrated empowerment into it and in the way this is actually one way that because of the pandemic we realized that sometimes doing online data collection is not necessarily a bad thing because many participants said that they were actually happy that they have a chance to reflect in their own time and then they dialogue and we submitted a paper recently and i just put a quote here that we can actually feel from people the challenges that they are going through uh, during this pandemic, how they actually experienced um, you know, this moral crisis when they had to do something that they usually would not do, that the dilemma of having to medicate children to keep everybody sane and safe uh, because of the pandemic. And so one last piece of story, um, this is the story of Ying Ying. And as I said before, my years in the academic learning in school, I often wonder how come I cannot talk about what I learned? How come I cannot draw on the wisdom that I had? 
And, but I did. So this is actually the story I wrote uh, and integrated into my master thesis. And they become the heading of all the different chapters. And it's inspired by a story that my mother told me all the time, except I transformed the, the, the traditional patriarchal values in it because the whole story when my mother and other people were telling me growing up was that we can be determined. If we determine, then we can find ways to actually achieve what we want and learn. And so the fireflies is about this boy who was very smart and he used a little cloth bag and catch all the fireflies and take it home and hang it up so that he had likes to study. I didn't like that because I don't think that fireflies should be treated that way. And so I have turned the story differently. And I won't tell you a story because my friend is actually helping me to turn it into a storybook. And so my last slide is really about um, there is a really nice podcast and it's called What's Left in the Ruins, Post-Qualitative Research with Dr. Jenny Sachel. And she had a very um, moderate way of thinking about that. And then on the other side, since we're all talking about post-humanism, we're talking about so many post things. Nowadays, uh, AI is a reality, big data is a reality. For those of, who, of us who engage in critical qualitative research, have we even started that dialogue? What are we going to do about it? And so those are the type of things that I want to raise. And I am excited about this. I feel very positive about everything. Uh, I see possibilities. We can reimagine. We can co-create. Um, we, we can do things ethically. Things could be expanded. Ideas could be expanded. And... Um, there could be transformation and all that kind of stuff. And the most important part for me is about connection. And so I am done. Thank you, Polly. Thanks, Josephine, both for the content and the, the, the ideas and also for your uh, modeling the way to present when technology goes sideways as inevitably it does. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, so we've got some time, yay, to uh, pose questions, uh, comments, any feedback, anything you'd like to ask Josephine or, or pose to the, to the group here. Um, please, you can either um, put your questions into the chat, uh, raise your hand, we'll keep track of that, or if you'd like to unmute yourself and turn your camera on for a minute, and um, I'm sure Josephine would love to see you. Give everybody just a minute there to, um, oh. Joan. Am I am I showing up here? I have a very unstable connection. Sorry. We got it, and we can hear you. You're good. Jo Josephine, that was <clears throat> okay. That's great. Josephine, I I loved your talk. It was really uh, it was super interesting, and I really uh, admire the the depth of your grappling with this stuff and because it I can identify with it as a retired person I, I was probably at much the same stage in your career uh, in my career as you are in yours when I confronted postmodernism and it, it was sort of the same well for me anyway it was the it felt like the same kind of challenge of trying to figure out what it was and it was a movement too that that had its had its trajectory and ended up in being, you know, spawning movements like critical realism and so on. These movements are constantly moving. And I see you as playing a part um, in starting the critique of that, of, that, of that movement and reacting to that movement. So really, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, think, um, I think really you epitomize and model the critical in critical qualitative research, which is what CQ is, is kind of all about and so on, is that the criticalness is not just about the object of our inquiry, but to make ourselves as researchers and knowers um, 
also the object of critical thinking. I mean, you're turning the critical onto, onto yourself and your own knowledge, which is a, is a, is a, is a fabulous way to, um, to model what critical qualitative research is. So thank you, thank you so much for doing that. It's been super stimulating to me. My head is just buzzing, um, buzzing. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what other people who, are, who have jumped in as much as you have uh, can, can say about it. Thanks, Joan. Josephine, we have a question from Rupaline and then from Brenda. Okay. I heard my, I don't think I raised my hand, but I can Hi. talk. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Rupaline. Unless <laughs> another Rupaline. <laughs> Or were you referring to someone else? Now I'm confused. No, no, this is to you. I, I got a, I got a side message. But oh, okay, what was the question? No, the the message was that Rupaline has something to say. So uh, I know you do, but it, it's okay. We can go on to Brenda. If you... Somebody is calling on me. Okay, I did have. I always have something to say. So. Josephine, it's so lovely to listen. It's funny because we work in different places. So this is the first yes. time I really get to listen to you deeply and the many ways in which you narrate this journey. Um, I have not read much about this post-qualitative movement. So it was really helpful to hear your orientation to it and also your analysis and you know reflections. I have to confess, I, was, I kind of was curious, like what is this post signifying? And it, it leads me to a question. So my assumption was, um, maybe this is telling, that the post was trying to imagine a qualitative inquiry that was not mired in Eurocentric thinking, including the kind of post-structural, post-modernist theory that I know was full of the theories that I read when I was a student and continue to read. That's what my assumption was. And I don't know if that's what you're going for with the post-post. and. As a someone who teaches and works in this area, I feel like every, I don't know, not really year, because maybe it's happening more frequently, but every time I turn to my syllabus or turn to the things I'm reading and relying upon, I'm each time I'm like, oh my God, there's so many dead white people on my in my brain. Like I just, and it's like each year I feel like I'm bringing in more range and then I'm still feeling like there's just, but there's still so many, you know, it's like, a, how did I forget that they weren't still there? So the question I had is, can you profess what it might look like just for us to do inquiry that is not informed by European philosophy? So that's a very, very good question, Rupaline. And as I declare, I'm still arriving. I told my cat that this morning. And the, so I think what you raise is actually evidence of the kind of Eurocentric dominance and the kind of white supremacy thinking that is existing. We are actually at a very good time right now when all kinds of institutions are saying, that, oh, we got to do EDI, but that in itself is another discussion. But what I'm thinking about is this is a reason why I want to challenge the post qualitative movement people that how can we leave something behind when we had not even arrived there? And that's really what I'm saying. And for us to arrive to something, I still have to give my students the dead white people's writing. And I'm okay with that because what I appreciate from um, Albert Marshall is his talk about two eyes seeing. It's even more than two eyes. And I really think that it's in that exchange and dialogue that we will come out with insight. And, but what I want to really challenge a post qualitative people is, you know, this is another saying that I heard about all the time. My grandmother, my mother always say that. They always say to us and say, why are you trying to run when you hadn't even learned to walk? Which is just a saying that they say all the time. And that's is how I feel. When I read this stuff, I thought, okay, that's grandma saying this again. So, if post-structural theories is about really overthrowing the inequities and the kind of power institutionalized and all this positivist thinking, then how is it that post-structural theorists and scholars 
are not open to look at in this post-structural thing, whose structure are we actually deconstructing? And what other things out there that I had not even come in touch? And that's the part that I'm trying to challenge. And um, there's a lot of work, but for me in my master class and in my PhD theory course, every single class I integrated scholars from different perspective into it, but they still had to learn the political economy because look at our healthcare system. So <laughs> it's a challenge, but we are all arriving. We're still arriving. So. Thanks, Josephine, and thanks, Rupalim. Sorry to put you on the spot there. Okay, nice great. work. Uh, Barb, Barb Gibson, hi. Got something to ask, comment? I think Brenda was before me, Polly. Hi, Polly. Hi, Josephine. Hi, <laughs> Barb. That's such okay. a long time. Look, <laughs> see, this Go is ahead, why Barb. I agreed Go to ahead. come to CQ to have a reunion. I'm making a decision that Barb's going to go before Brenda. Okay. I'm really interested in what Brenda has to say, though. Um, uh, this is a fascinating conversation and one that I'm so glad that we're having at CQ. And thank you, Josephine, for your um, provocative presentation and raising some of these issues. I, I think that the debate or the critique that you're raising about what is post-qualitative, how does post-qualitative relate to other alternative epistemologies and methodologies, um, I think that's a really important debate and has to be an ongoing debate. But I wonder if we're going too quickly to the critique without engaging in post-qualitative first, perhaps. Um, you've positioned Elizabeth St. Pierre as, as, as some kind of leader of the post-qualitative movement. Um, and I'm not sure I would agree that it's a movement and I'm not sure that we have to only engage with her work because there's lots of folks doing this work, including people working in post-colonial spaces are engaging with these ideas, engaging with the Liz and Gutari's ideas, talking about what's the overlap between, uh, for example, indigenous methodologies and these kinds of uh, epistemologies. And there are tensions there for sure. But I'm worried that we're just chucking it all because we're saying, well, this isn't being done well enough and we need it. until this gets resolved, we can't use it. I use these ideas all the time in my own work. I'm finding it stimulates my thinking. So many of the questions and, and challenges you raised for us, Josephine, have been the ones that I use in my work. But I, I use them by pulling on to Liz and Guattari. So I, I'm, I'm just a little bit worried we're, we're demonizing a, a whole tradition that very much overlaps with the critical traditions that we've been trained in um, without really engaging with, with the ideas, with the philosophies, um, and, and with the um, axiological issues that you uh, raised as well, because I think these kinds of methodologies are very much about transformational research. So I'll leave it there. Thanks again. So Barb, I totally agree with you. I am not against uh, post-structuralism. I am uncomfortable with someone who is kind of imminent in the post-qualitative. So if you punch in post-qualitative inquiry, whose name pop up? And many of them really only focus on post-structural uh, theory. And this is what I am having problem with. So if they actually come out with a, a movement that say post-structural qualitative inquiry, I'm totally fine with that. The part that I'm challenging is the post. What are we posting? That's the part that I don't understand because what are we really leaving behind and what are we against? And that's the part that I am actually posting. I'll just uh, respond quickly by saying I'm not sure it's a dichotomy that we're leaving behind and going towards. I, I see it more as integrative, but um, that's probably a broader conversation and I want to leave space for other people to engage. Thanks. Thanks, Barb. Okay, Brenda, sorry about that. Oh, I don't know. My question's changed so many times already listening to Barb, listening to Josephine. So I don't know where to start except to say, what you just talked about was really interesting to me. And one of the things that I talk about with my students is that be wary when you see post, because post can mean um, with, um, so everything that's gone on and then with, or it can mean everything against that or disrupting that or leaving that behind. So I think that 
understanding post is actually a really interesting conversation to have. And I, I really thank you for raising that, Josephine. Um, what I originally wanted to ask you about, one of the things I love that you said, so it's more of a commentary and whether you can kind of extend on that a little bit. You said post-humanism has always been in some people's ways of life. And I think that's a really nice way to remind us that these theories come from, um, from living, they're living theories. They can be living theories or live theories. Um, but, I, but I wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about that because I think where my head goes is I think, oh, she's thinking about indigenous methodologies and, and, and some of, of the other ways of knowing. And, and, and I'm always kind of a bit nervous about bringing post-humanism and post-qualitative and St. Pierre and all the players in with indigenous ways of knowing and, and confusing the two or, or appropriating something that shouldn't be there. So it makes me a bit unsure. And I don't know if that's what you were saying. So I've said a couple of things. I'll just let you respond. Justine. That is absolutely not what I am saying. I in fact feel very uncomfortable when I hear indigenous methods or methods from other non-Western, non-Eurocentric, uh, you know, wisdom as alternative or other theories. Even in our everyday language, when we say alternative method, what are we saying? Um, so those are the type of things that I want to challenge because if we think about the Taoist philosophy that had been used in Asia for hundreds and thousands of years to guide certain mm. way of thinking uh, within the Taoist philosophy, humans is only one part of the entire Tao. And so you can't really separate them. And so when I challenge the post and you see, if people are seeing that I'm thinking with, but we can move forward, that's okay too. But for me, language is important then whoever start the movement, engage in the movement, need to give that clarity to support us to understand. And so to think about after when they had not even, so for me, my initial Bitmoji reaction is, so here we go again. We need to start a movement so there's more academic capital for some people. Here mm. people are being left behind when there are more researchers now engaging in qualitative research using methodology that actually challenge Eurocentrism, using post-colonial yeah. methodology, then we are posting ourselves out of the way. So what are we? We're constantly being left in the margin. And that is something that I refused. I would refuse. So I would never do post-qualitative inquiry. I do critical qualitative research and inquiry, and I'm still very happy. And that doesn't mean that I'm against Bourdieu. I'm not against Bourdieu. I still think through Bourdieu. That doesn't mean that I am against Qatari. I'm not against Deleuze. I am against people claiming that they can draw on post-structural theory, and now we can post-qualitative inquiry. And so that's the part that I feel. Um, it's a conversation I'm still arriving. I don't know yes. the answer, and I don't have time to be like a student. Thanks, Thank Josephine. You. Thank you. Thanks, Josephine. We've got a couple more, just a couple more minutes. Eric, I think we have time for your question. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Josephine, for your um, presentation, which I thought was so interesting and helpful in many different ways. Um, so because we don't have a lot of time, I just want to ask you maybe quickly, the question that's provoked for me is, do you have a sense out of your own practice of research, is there a way for people either individually or collectively to practice humility in research? Um, so much of the discussion around post uh, qualitative inquiry reminds me of uh, previous versions of you know, intellectual movements that come up and they seem to be somehow very, there's a lot of hubris, a lot of uh, overstatement about claims and you know this is the best thing since whatever. And it seems to have reproduced itself in different iterations. Do you have a sense out of your own work about, is there a way to think that what you're doing is good and, and maybe better than other things for certain purposes? Is there a way to practice that with also being humble or is, is humility a kind of axiological principle for you? Do you have any thoughts about any of that? Uh Yes, I personally would only engage in community-based action research uh, because 
I live as a racialized woman. I'm privileged because I'm a professor, but the people I work with, the struggles are real. Living with schizophrenia, you know, being marginalized in multiple ways, being racialized, living with HIV, HIV stigma, and, you know, experiencing seriously housing uh, insecurity, food insecurity. And I think the humility part is really, really important. And this is why critically turning the lens on ourselves is very, very important. And so the way that we have been engaging is that every single project that I engage in, we have team members who are from the community living with the experience. And on top of that, we make sure that resources hiring uh, uh, people from the communities, but not only use them as RA, go and recruit our people, and then we write beautiful papers. And actually they go through the entire research process, engage in everything. They, and many of them through this type of experience actually had entered into educational institute, finished their diploma, finished their degree, and in graduate school, some of them now, uh, you know, venue scholars, and others have become leaders in the communities, becoming board members. We have been pushing our partner who actually sponsored those research to actually take up the kind of framework that we are using. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that it's really a total you know, equal playing field because the system and structure doesn't allow that. Ultimately, if I sign off that name on the research, I'm responsible for many, many other things. But I think we could engage in ways that are really more on humility and compassion and seeing each other. And the intervention that we are doing actually is about that. It's about how do we find methods so that we can engage in a way that we can support each other to let go of some of those identities. And so those are the type of things. And sometimes it's not easy because uh, I would have comment by, you know, grant reviewer to say that, well, the NPI is not very productive. Well, it's kind of hard to be productive when you're also spending time to be human. You know, I can't just hire some bright RA, pay them 40 bucks an hour and write all my papers. We do it together in the communities. So it's a give and take. And I like to follow my values and that's what I do. Thank you. Thanks, Josephine. I think your, your response, how to be productive and to be human and humane at the same time, to have that dignity is a beautiful way to end today. So thanks everyone for coming, for your engaging conversation and discussion. Uh, I just know we're all going to leave here with our minds firing and also feeling like we have yet to arrive here. Thank you so much, Josephine. Super appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.